Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome to the stage from Screencraft, John Rhodes, and from the Writers Guild Foundation, Enid Portuguese. John Rhodes Thank you. Um, very honored to be here um, at the Writers Guild Foundation presenting this panel on international storytelling. Um, and very happy to be here at UCFTI. The genesis of this panel came from um, Emily and I discussing you know, how to host a conversation around writing between Hollywood and China. Um, and it came out of the fact that ScreenCraft has now, for the second year in a row, a um, China Hollywood Screenwriting Fellowship, where we connect winners with um, a trip to China and mentorship with Chinese development executives and producers, and um, also here in LA with Hollywood mentors. And that's going to be launching in a couple weeks, so check out ScreenCraft.org for that. And without further ado, let's get into it. I'll hand it off to Enid. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you all for being here. The Writers Guild Foundation is thrilled to co-present this panel with ScreenCraft. We are a nonprofit organization whose mission is to preserve and promote the craft of writing for the screen. Uh, so we are always excited to be a part of conversations where writers talk about their process for telling their stories, as well as how the industry shares those stories with the world. Uh, please do visit us if you're in Los Angeles um, at our library on 3rd and Fairfax. It's open to the public, not just members, as well as events that we throw throughout the year featuring film and TV writers. Um, so let's get this conversation started. Um, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today. She is the Director of Education and Outreach at ScreenCraft, Emily Dell. Well, thank you so much to uh, the Writers Guild Foundation and Enid. Thank you so much to ScreenCraft. Uh, and thank you to our host here. We, well, I am very, very excited to be part of a conversation about creativity with some of the finest minds in, um, in creativity today. And so I'd like to just dive in. I'll start with a little bit of background on these incredible people sitting to my left, your right. And that's Amanda Silver, grew up in New York City and received her bachelor's in history from Yale University and MFA from the University of Southern California in screenwriting. And her grandfather, Sidney Buckman, was a founding member of the Writers Guild and wrote the Academy Award nominated Mr. Sc Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, wow. among many others. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> Rick, Rick Jaffa studied history and political science at SMU, earned his MBA at, uh, also at USC, and then began his career as an agent. But Silver and Jaffa are best known as husband and wife and collaborators for the past 25 years on some of the biggest titles in Hollywood. So uh, they successfully conceived and helped re reboot the Planet of the Apes franchise. The third uh, war for the Planet of the Apes just opened this past summer on July 14th. Um, box Office Mojo is listing 487 million US box office. Uh, in 2015, they co-wrote co the blockbuster Jurassic World, recently grossed, uh, or uh, it has, the gross more than 1.6 billion worldwide, fourth gross, highest grossing film of all time. And then recently they have teamed up uh, with the Oscar winning director and writer James Cameron to co-write the much anticipated sequels to a little film called Avatar. These are currently in pre-production and they are also working on the script for a live action Disney version of the film Mulan, which is currently in pre-production. We haven't seen any of that money, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Brown oversees production and development at head, uh, as the head of production for STX Films. He started his career as a development executive with New Line in 2002 and was most recently senior vice president of production. While at New Line, he executive produced the Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart comedy Central Intelligence, Key and Peele's Keanu, the latest installment of the Vacation franchise with Ed Helms and Christina Applegate, as well as the global box office San Andreas, also starring Dwayne Johnson. Other, 
His other credits include the hit film Horrible Bosses and Horrible Bosses 2, the Adam Shankman musical Rock of Ages, the worldwide hit Journey to the Mysterious Island, the Harold and Kumar series, and the highly successful romantic comedies New Year's Eve and Valentine's Day. Wow. Yeah. All right, so we are here on a panel called Writing for an Inter International Audience. And you have all worked to create some of, some of the films in recent years, years that have been the most popular in the United States, in China, and worldwide. And I think what is exciting for all of us here today is to talk about how those films from their earliest stages were made. And that means digging into the craft of storytelling. To, to really talk about how do we inspire audiences worldwide. And so I'd like to start with a very general question. What do you think accounts for the international popularity of some of these titles that I've listed? Well, I think that uh, in some cases, having an existing IP gives you a leg up, obviously. You know, there's, there's a built-in uh, interest and want to see and uh, titles like Planet of the Apes and Jurassic and... and so uh, there's a built-in interest in saying, well, what are these? What are they going to do with this story? What's going to be new and so forth? But uh, but ultimately, I don't, I don't, you know, that's just that's just a small part of just a small part of it. Yeah, I would say in on the studio side, it often gets reduced down to is there a vi universal visual component that tends to be a a tool that you can sort of lean on that has a better chance of working in various territories around, around the world, including China, um, that doesn't rely on specific local language um, uh, idioms or, or political situations. And, and there is something just fun and universal about seeing a huge dinosaur run rampant in a, you know, in a dinosaur amusement park that you don't need to speak any language to understand the visual spectacle and fun that that can create. And then um, along with that, it's always great to have uh, characters that uh, bring something essentially human to the parties so that um, people in any culture and any country can relate to them and what they're going through. Yeah, and there are elements of the human condition that run across all languages, cultures, ethnicities, countries, and if those, as Amanda said, if those characters that you're presenting are going through universally relatable um, and sort of human truths that everyone can relate, love, loss, tragedy, laughter, thrills, fear, fear like right. that tends to allow for um, uh, those characters in those movies to work in a more effective way around the world. Yeah, I can give one example, though. It's when uh, we did the first draft of the first Apes movie, we got to the second act and realized that we were about to embark on maybe 40, 50 pages where there wasn't any dialogue, which was a challenge to us as writers uh, we were excited about the challenge, but in terms of what Sam was saying, you know, you're basically watching a film play out uh, with no need for dialogue. Yeah. And in terms of Caesar's character, you know, that, that whole idea really stemmed from an idea about that character. And we really wanted to create a character that anyone, I mean, anyone, anywhere on the planet who'd ever you know, known a teenager, been a teenager, was going to be a teenager, anyone that felt alienated at that point, which Caesar basically was a teenager when he's thrown into the facility, uh, that, you know, everyone could relate to. And it was visual. Mm -hmm. Another piece to it, also on top of all those things, is that I think an audience can smell it on the movie if you're just making the movie to make money. So if there's some sort we of... We hope they can't smell it, by the way. <laughs> Just be clear. But if there's some sort of premise or, or theme connected to the movie that, you know, for, for example, uh, in, in uh, Jurassic World, it would be that uh, commercialism and greed destroys itself. 
You know, you could say that's the theme of the movie. And even though you're not um, preaching to the audience, that's never a good idea. They, they, they know that there's a reason to tell this story. Yeah, and Beyond. that brings up... Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. go ahead. Well, that brings up another really important component that we think about and discuss a lot um, on the studio side, which is when you're trying to build a piece of content that has the, and you're trying to give that piece of content, a movie, a story, the greatest probability or potential to work, not just in North America, but around the world, you can find yourself in this uh, myopic trap of thinking, well, it needs to work in every territory. So let's get an element that can resonate right. in China. Let's get an element that can resonate in India, an element that resonate in South America. And suddenly you look up and you Frankenstein this story, this project together that has no resonance for any of those territories because it doesn't feel authentic. It wasn't birthed in an authentic right. way. And that's the real challenge for us is how do we build something that can work for a global audience but that feels um, uh, uh, organic and authentic, it doesn't feel like you've just sort of patched something together. Yeah, it's a tail wagging the dog. Yeah, exactly. So on that note, we often say in writing, specificity is strength. And so how do you balance trying to be very specific, maybe to a setting or culture or certain character, yeah. but also opening it up so that it is accessible? I would argue that the strength is always in the specificity and the relatability. You may have to educate the audience about a certain culture. You know, for example, you take a movie like The Godfather. Mm -hmm. Well, that in that opening wedding, he teaches you everything you need to know about what it is to be an Italian, part of one of those families at that time. But the, the specificity of the characters and that the setting grounds the drama. It makes it... It, it, it gives it that um, authenticity that Sam was describing, mm -hmm. that feeling of, of it being organic. If you're not grounded by the detail, mm -hmm. um, it feels false. You know, but, it feels general and vague. Yeah, and, and The Godfather is a good example. That was a very specific uh, portrait of a Italian-American family that had obviously had... Uh, uh, that was in the sort of organized crime, but the themes that that movie was exploring were very universal. And so it was universal themes explored through and, and sort of presented through the lens of uh, characters that were painted in a very specific way. And were, again, I can't relate to being an, um, an Italian-American uh, gangster, but I can relate to some of the themes that the, that the characters are going through. Well, family. Yeah. You know, it's a family story, and uh, all families have their issues, you know. There are, there's no such thing as a functional family, I don't think. But, uh, but yeah, so, I, you know, with that particular example, you know, you're talking about a group of people that were really doing horrible things, but, uh, but you like them because of the specificity of the family code and their relationships to one another and the loyalty between them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we do an enormous amount of research uh, on, our, on our scripts. And uh, with Mulan, we spent, I don't know, months and months reading about um, uh, you know, Chinese history, the Tang Dynasty, uh, about uh, you know, cultural things, fam uh, familial piety, uh, filial piety. And, so, uh, and then on Avatar, I have to tell you guys, I, you know, uh, Jim is just the, uh, he's, kinda, he's, he's the real deal when it comes to <laughs> doing his homework. And he can tell you how many rivets are in those space shuttles that come down and, and explain literally. it. Literally. <laughs> yeah, literally. No, seriously. He'll tell you about the plant life and the gravitational pull of Pandora versus, you know, some other planet. And, and you know, it's just stuff that it's... And when we went to work with him, it was stuff he really wanted us to know. And so we... What was weird is we slowly started to feel like maybe that that was the reality and that our world was, it was not real, you know. But, uh, but you know, you, you, you need to know all those things, and then... And then when you go into the movie, when you watch his movies, you're 100% invested that the, the characters feel the real. the characters and the story, yeah. yeah. The story it, it, is real. You yeah. know, you, you, you go on this journey with them, and you're there 100%. If you don't do the... I'm sorry. If you don't do the research, though, it's like, then... Uh, and you don't get to know the world then you find you're writing stuff that you've just seen in another movie or on television. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And that's when it's really, it really gets uh, dicey. Yeah, I'm not sure an audience could uh, recognize and articulate why they respond to certain right. characters in certain movies, but I would argue that a huge component of an audience's engagement in a, in a character and in a movie is related to the amount of homework that the writer, filmmakers, and all the, everyone involved in the production has put into every single element of that production. If every character is presented, and you may not even know this, but there's 100 pages written about that character that don't even come through on screen, it does come through in sort of the actor's performance and the way the filmmaker's presenting it. Yeah. Jim, knowing the number of rivets on the space shuttle and Avatar, it may sound ridiculous, but that is a, um, tends to be an indicator of how uh, satisfying that piece of that movie is going to be. Yeah. Right, it's not a conscious thing from the audience. Yeah. Like, these are facts the audience will never yeah. know. But you can but sense that hollowness. You can it's sense that inauthenticity. You can sense the sort of the, the, the fabricated nature of it versus something that feels realer and, and deeper. And when you watch something and it's got that patina of depth and reality to it, that's part of, that's part of why yeah. that's happened. So what is your process? You, it, uh, you, it sounds like you dig really deep and surround yourself with all of this research, but then how do you kind of, especially with a very large property that you know, you, you, you're kind of steps down in the process in, how do you find the heart? And where, where, do, you, where do you ground yourself story-wise? Well, it's always the character's journey, the singular character or the group of characters. And um, you know, it takes some hard work and sometimes leaps of faith because you don't go in usually and the character and the world are already alive. You have to kind of blow life into them. You've mm -hmm. got you've to pray that that happens. You've got to show up and do your research and um, spend time with these characters. And sooner or later, if you're lucky, they come alive and then they have a journey that's, um, uh, that you're going and you're going to go on this journey with them. And sometimes, I mean, I know this sounds crazy and obvious at the same time, but the story doesn't exist beforehand. Like as a screenwriter, mm -hmm. sometimes you're looking at something and you, you, you don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but you know something has to happen on page 40. You're not sure what it is, and so you're searching for it. It's, it's, you've gotta, it's as if it already exists and you're discovering it. Does that sound crazy? It's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, it, Amanda talked about this earlier, though. So in terms of the process, the very first thing we always ask is, well, why, are, why are we making this movie? I mean, what, what's the point of telling this story or retelling it, in some cases, you know, now? And what can we say? And, and, and is it valid? And, and is it worth the effort? And once we've got that, then we start talking about the characters, but then why does this character need this journey right now? I mean, why, why now? Why is, to, you know, why is this day different than the other day? So we, uh, so we spend a lot of time on that, and, and then you get those two things to marry one another. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really the beginning. Um, and then in terms of existing properties, um, it's tough because, you know, um, you're talking about uh, you're talking about properties that people love, much beloved, you know, like Jurassic and, and and Planet of the Apes, for example. Well, and Avatar too, uh, and Mulan. Um, people bring a lot to that, and and uh, and so you have to offer them. You have to offer the audiences something new and something different, but you also have to deliver on the stuff that they love about those pre-existing titles. Both at the same time. At the same time. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of a hard thing to walk. I mean, with Apes, we decided early on we weren't going to have any time travel. We were just going to tell it straight ahead. And we weren't going to try to compete with Rod Serling's image of the Statue of Liberty on the beach. We just weren't going to try to compete because, it wouldn't, A, we didn't think we could. You know? <laughs> but uh, it wasn't important to the story that we were, we were telling at the time. So, and that was tough because we were worried that people would say, wait a minute, what, there's no big twist, or wait a minute, there's no time travel, and, but that was a choice that we made, but we, we really tried to honor the fan base and the, uh, and the original piece of material as best we could. Yeah, it's a, I mean, you guys have your hands full because 
if you're thinking about sequels, yeah. remakes, reboots, it's a double-edged sword. There's an advantage because there's an awareness, a general awareness, or there's a presumed awareness of the title and the sort of the basic story, but then there's that added challenge of having to overcome this, the baggage of expectations that an audience will bring to that movie. Right. We talk about a lot with sequels, which is, by definition, if you're contemplating a sequel to a movie, the first movie achieved some level of success. And if achieved some level of success, it also made an imprint on an audience. And if it made an imprint on an audience, part of that imprint was born out of novelty, discovery, newness. And the sequel, by definition, is robbed of those right. elements. There's no more novelty, there's no more newness, there's no more discovery. And it's a real challenge for the writers and filmmakers to find new things to sort of put into that sequel, remake, reboot, to make it feel fresh and new again. Because as much as it's an advantage to have a piece of IP or movie that, that worked, sort of create some wind at your back going into the market, there's still expectations are different and I would argue higher for the audience going into that movie. So then Sam, what's your process? You working with writers like Rick and Amanda, uh, you know, where, like what's, what's your back and forth and, and how do you kind of shepherd the film? <laughs> well, first thing I would say is Daddy. there is, <laughs> there is, I'm not a writer. I've never been a writer, but the notion of staring at a blank computer screen or typewriter page is, I imagine, and know enough to know that it is incredibly daunting. To create is different than to critique. And what we do is we critique. And, and yes, we can identify sort of notions of, we think the world wants something like this. Let's go find some people to help write that for us. But for the most part, we are react. They're creating and we're reacting. Um, they're is a sort of adage that I and a lot of my colleagues live by, which is our job is not to be the funniest, smartest uh, person in the room. Our job is to identify and hire people that are smart, funny, creative, clever, and empower them and give them the resources they need. And I try to remind myself of that every day, every time I give writers a set of notes. Um, and you know, the other thing we, I, and my company, the way we approach filmmakers and writers as a rule is, here are our thoughts. Let's have a conversation about why we're feeling the way we feel. And it's up to you to decide how much of that you want to incorporate and how much you don't want to incorporate. And we will flag the stuff that, feel, that feels more important to us and we'll flag the stuff that feels uh, uh, less important. And we just want to have a conversation because usually, and you guys can speak to this better than I can, if someone isn't feeling something, the way that they articulate what, they're, what they feel is missing may not be the right answer, but the feeling behind that, right. there may be something there and it's worth exploring. And it is, again, I tend to prefer to keep it conversational. And we'll also oftentimes start a conversation, well, well what was your intent with that character, this scene, this, this act, this movie? And did that intent resonate or come through to me and, and me as me and me also me as sort of trying to represent a, a general audience? And sometimes it's just as simple as, oh, that's what you wanted to do. Well, it didn't quite connect for me. And yeah, if you just change this, this, and this, maybe it would, and they go off and change it, and it suddenly does. Oftentimes it's as simple as that, which is not a, not a good or bad or this works or this didn't work. It was, it was just trying to sort of help the writers, the filmmakers, um, uh, present their work in the way that they intended it to be presented. Yeah, we should so, work with him. He's yeah, no, <laughs> this is all, <laughs> yeah, this is me on my best day. <laughs> it's so true, though. If, you, if we've ever gotten a, a note that we know is off, we, we, we also know that it's coming from someplace. Yeah. So maybe, maybe the suggestion that, that we're being given might be wrong, or, or we know that's not going to work, but... It's, it's very instructive to, le to learn that something hasn't landed or something you think is on the page, a moment isn't, isn't there. Yeah. And, and you often hear the note behind the note, and that's sort of the, the right. distillation of that. We were really lucky. We, uh, our first movie was with Curtis Hansen, a terrific director and great guy. And uh, he taught us that no matter how silly a note might sound, it is coming from something. 
And, uh, and again, it's like, well, what was the intent? And well, if our intent on this page was to show this about a specific character or take the story in a, in a surprising direction, then that's the note might, their note might be on a certain page, but what they're really talking about is this other thing. And, and, so. and what I have found, and there are, I'm sure, books of stories of these, which is some studio head will come in and say, well, I want that bus green instead of red. And sometimes it's just whimsical. Sometimes yeah. it's not based in any sort of, there's no justification for it. That, I think, can be challenging for filmmakers and writers. But for the most part, if someone comes in and says, hey, I want that bus to be red, not green, and here's why, because there's a green background and the bus will get lost and we can't see it, and that's important for our trailer because the, the, we need the bus to convey some special thing in the trailer, and if it doesn't work in the trailer, then we're not as confident in our ability to sell the movie, that, I imagine, that note would be met with much more sort of a, a much more constructive reaction than just simply coming in and mandating, I want that bus red, you know, red or green. Yeah. So how does the, uh, also for Sam, how does the international structure of STX um, as a business affect what you guys try to champion? So we, we have as an organization, a number of strategic investors, a number of slate partners that represent a lot of the biggest markets around the world, most notably China. Um, we've never felt, uh, at least I've never felt, a sort of uh, a, a creative influential force from beyond pushing me in certain directions. Hey, don't cast this person, cast this person. Don't tell this story, tell this story. Um, I don't feel that on a daily basis. However, and it, and it frustrates me that, that the local trade, you know, the trades, everything tends to sort of be represented, and it's getting better, presented to the world in the form of domestic North America box office as sort of this leading indicator of whether a, a movie is a, is a financial hit or not. And that's like saying, if the movie worked in Texas, is it a hit or not? Like, there is a whole world of, of, of ticket buyers out there. So you have to look at any given movie, not as something that can or can't work in North America. Sure, that's a big component of it. North America is still the, the, the biggest market, but can this movie work for a global audience? And that is something that we think about and talk about and, and actually try to quantify on every single project that we're going into. And if there is a piece of material that just feels like it's going to be really challenged outside North America, well, it doesn't mean you can't make it. It just means you have to make it for a price that justifies its existence just limited to the North American um, marketplace or the English-speaking territories. And if you have a movie that feels like it could absolutely resonate for a global audience, well, then that creates some relief on the, on the budget threshold because it just has much more potential. So we think about things in in global terms, not, and we have a lot of global strategic and financial partners in our organization, I think is just simply an acknowledgement that these movies that we're making here in Los Angeles are really consumed around the world, and it would be imprudent to, um, to not acknowledge that and try to build movies for that audience. So coming back to writing, does that, when you're looking at a, uh, at a, a script, what is it that you're looking for that maybe indicates an international sensibility or success? You know, we, we it's, hard, it's hard to answer. And what I would say is, that's not the first thing we think about. The first thing we think about is, is this a good story that's worth telling and is told well? Well, maybe those are the related. Yeah, and, and, and that, that is sort of, once you sort of can connect to that and once you can say, wow, I was moved by this script, I was engaged in this story, I, was, I love this character, I love this world, I love all these things. Then you do the secondary and tertiary analysis of, is this something by its very nature that will only resonate in certain select markets, uh, North America, or only in Russia, or only in certainly, or does it have the components that we talked about before that at least allow it to have a chance of working in, uh, in the international marketplace? And again, a lot of it just comes back to relatable themes, which are not as hard to come by as one would think. Um, and just making sure that you're not stepping on any third rails for any of the biggest markets. And I think uh, we don't have to get into that, but, but and those tend to be easily adjusted. Um, if, you, if you have a, a horrible villain in your movie and that horrible villain is Russian and it's just a despicable character, 
Well, that might make it a little bit harder for that movie to, to work in Russia because you're portraying Russian, if, if that's the only portrayal of Russian in the movie, as a, you know, as a, as a villainous character. And, and if that's an important mark of you and if that's sort of how that, that project will probably be received there, you might want to adjust it to you know, a generic villain, you know, however you want to define it. But there, there are certain things you can go back into the script and the movie and say, oh, gee, that one little moment or that one character or the one representation suddenly makes it hard for this big swath of audience, maybe we should adjust that. So back to, to Rick and Amanda, when, you're, um, when you are working on these kind of larger properties that you're trying to, uh, to, to, to move with let, you know, cross borders, what, is, what do you feel like is the most important emotion you're really trying to get your audience to feel? Something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have to feel something. Yeah. So, um, yeah, well, you know, the funny thing is we, what we work a, uh, a lot with is really two emotions that, are, that go hand in hand, which are hope and fear. Mm -hmm. And it's really simple. If we go into a sequence, you know, uh, you hope you you want the audience to hope one thing happens, and yet fear that that one thing is never going to happen. In other words, they have rooting interest on every single page. Every mm -hmm. page. I mean, every part of every page. Mm -hmm. Like there, when 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 we write a script that's working, we know at every moment you could just like flip the script open and point to random places. We know what we're trying to get the audience to feel. They're really worried. They're hoping he gets there in time, or they're worried that he, the, she's going to find out. Or they're, you know, you're, you, what you're doing is you're engaging the audience, mm -hmm. um, so that you know, if the filmmaker had had the the, um, I was trying to do that example, but so that the whole audience would be like leaning the oh, way this, if they yeah, couldn't yeah, yeah. see down. If if the and, filmmaker uh, Rosemary's, Rosemary's baby, Rosemary's right. baby. There's a very famous story where uh, they set up the shot. It was, the, the shot is someone sitting on a bed and the camera's uh, on Ruth the other Gordon. side of a doorway. Yeah. So it's through a door, Ruth Gordon. And uh, this, the shot was set up and, and Roman Polanski, who directed it, came in and, and saw her. And the way it was framed was that she was sitting perfectly in the frame. It was a beautiful, beautiful shot, perfectly in frame and in the middle of this doorway. And he said, no, 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 no. You put the camera over here so that you can't really like see, they only her. see part and the, of her. And the, and the DP only... was like, "No, no, you know, you, you only be able to see her." She said, "No, no, trust me. This is the way. This is the best way to do it." And so, in the first test screening, when it came to that shot, they noted they were in the back of the theater. Everybody was doing this <laughs> to try to see around that door. And so, yeah. So we use that so example. The point is, though, that you that it, whether whatever the audience is feeling, they're feeling something because they're engaged. And I, th I th believe people go to the movies or they watch TV or whatever, whether they're conscious of this or not, for catharsis. They want a good cry or they want a good scare or they, they want to kind of work through the feelings they're having uh, without it being about them, hmm. you know, the fictional character. So um, even if it's a comedy, whether it's a comedy or a tragedy, the point is that you keep them feeling something. Yeah. Yeah, and the producers, you know, you hope they'll succeed, and yet you know they won't. <laughs> you know? So, uh, so that's yeah. Those, and then and then like the bigger thoughts of love or hate or whatever really are are just stem from stem from that. Is that ever culturally specific, or is it um, an example of this? Might be Mulan. Mm -hmm. um, it, are you are you Leaning into, and, and I, I'll, this will be the last one because I'm sorry, we need to go to Q&A. But oh. yeah, are you leaning into one specific, uh, something that you want something to feel that might be more specific to a culture? It's so interesting because with Mulan, you know, I don't know if people know this, but she, she's an iconic figure in China. Mm -hmm. She's a 7th century ballad was about Mulan. And even today, children, school children are taught the ballad of Mulan. Um, in school, so it's very important for them culturally. We, we had done a lot of research, and then when we handed the script in, we had advisors. Disney has been very much into figuring out culturally, and there was a lot we had to learn about the way that the 
Chinese think about family and family obligation versus the way Americans, for example, think about that. So our job was to make those um, themes resonant, resonate with, with everybody, no matter what culture you're in. But you have to understand it first and then educate about how, what, what the situation Mulan specifically is in, in her family. What, what's her um, motivation to go on the journey she goes on? Yeah, you can't, you know, we, we, we're not relying on the, what would be a classically Western journey because she's not Western. Mm -hmm. She's not going on this journey for herself. Yeah, no. All right, I think we have time for a couple of questions from the audience. They're okay. all going to be about Avatar. <laughs> <laughs> right here in the front. I actually would love to ask about Avatar, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> um, uh, really happy to have all you guys here. This has been really interesting. Uh, I just wanted to ask, specifically with Rick and Amanda, uh, I'm almost done at USC in the film school, and I wanted to ask you guys about those sort of post-college years, about sort of navigating your way in to where you are as writers now. Well, I have my story. I, I got really lucky coming out of USC because I sold my script. But um, I think what I would say is if you're a writer, are you, are you a writer? in the writing program? Have you made a film or have you, are, is, are you writing a script? Or? Okay. Well, go ahead. You want to? I, 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 and by the way, I, I, I have a whole yeah, spiel. Yeah, you're probably much better. I mean, yeah, so people spiel? come to me all yeah. the time. Like, people like you come to me all the time. And I'm not a writer, but sometimes I'm the only person they know in the industry and say, hey, I'm an aspiring writer. I'll talk about that. Some, if an aspiring actor, aspiring director, the, the guidance is a little bit different. But for writing, what I tend to say is, and, and you guys can sort of back me up because you're actual writers, um, is you won't know if you have both the talent, but almost more importantly, and I guess sort of people are blind to it, the constitution mm -hmm. to be a working writer until you've written your 10th discrete screenplay. So the sooner you can get through to your 10th, the sooner you'll know, am I good enough? And do I like it? Um, and that's also a way to get away from a trap that a lot of people that I've in, sort of encountered can fall into uh, who are aspiring writers, which is, They'll labor through one screenplay and then just keep tweaking and tweaking and tweaking the screenplay for years. And they're never actually, I mean, maybe, they're, maybe these guys were the few people on the earth that were touched by God and just were the first time they put pen to paper, it was genius. That's not the case. You got to do your 10,000 hours. It's a learned thing. You can't just sort of jump in. It looks easy. It looks sexy. It looks romantic. It is not. Um, so the only way to sort of get there is just to do the work and get 10 going and don't fall in the trap of reworking one on and on. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really good advice. That's such a good spiel, I like that. Because <laughs> so um, even if, if we were very, very uh, fortunate and, uh, and were able to sell our first screenplays and so forth, however, I will say that the toughness and constitution that Sam's talking about is really vital because you know, we were really lucky, we were young, we got married, we were sold scripts, we got a movie made. It's like, oh my God, this is the most incredible romantic fantasy of all time. And then you have a kid, and then you have another kid, and then, you know, and then suddenly, we, you know, you got three movies that looked like they were going to go, and then, but then they didn't go for reasons that had nothing to do with the script. And, uh, and before you know it, your agent's not calling you back. And, you know, you've, and we've been there. And, uh, and so you got to, you know, you, you really do have to be dedicated and know what you're getting into. Uh, and it's tough, you know. I would also uh, say, and I don't know if this was your experience, you know, especially when you're at the early stages, you're so fixated on getting there and having one transaction, having someone option your script or buy your script, which is a huge, rare, special achievement. Number two is only a little bit easier. It's not like once you get there, you're like, right. they welcome you into the special club and they, they set you up for life. That is not the case. It's a continued uh, labor, and it's often that is labor. Yeah, and this 10,000 hour thing, I, I really believe in it because uh, you know, we've been at this for almost 30 years. And sometimes we look at each other and realize we're just now learning things. <laughs> we're just now starting to figure out things where is that I feel extremely confident and no matter what we tackle next, I know the level of quality that we're going to bring to it. It may not get made, but I know the level of quality that we can control. 
but I tell you, it's taken a lot of, we, you know what, we pay attention, you know, like really pay attention. You go to the movies or watch the television show, it's like, well, uh, what is it about this that's moving me? Or what is it about this that's not moving me? And uh, Also, what Sam said is really important that um, you've got to love the writing. You've got to love it because um, it's hard. It's a hard business. Yeah. So, read you know, read and watch. Yeah, exactly. Read a lot. Get a lot of eyeballs on your material. People you trust, you know, that will be honest with you. Um, and a lot of people will... That's hard to do. That's hard to find the right people. But as many people as you can get to read your stuff, that's the other thing. Uh, I'm being told we actually have to wrap up, but oh. if you guys wouldn't mind maybe taking one or two by the side of the stage, but I know they both have to run. Um, and so uh, let me just say a, a huge thank you to the Writers Guild Foundation, to ScreenCraft, to all of you for joining us uh, to celebrate this process of international storytelling and learning what we can, but really a big thank you to the people sitting next to me. So let's give them a round of applause. And thank you to Emily. Thank yeah, you very thank much. Thank you, Emily. Very happy thank to be Thank you all. Here.